Uh, good morning. My name is Paul King. I'm executive of the UK Green Building Council. I know many of you, but I'm sure not all of you. Um, uh, delighted to welcome you to this UK Green Building Council London 2012 Sustainability Lessons Learned series. I always have to read that because it's a bit of a mouthful. In partnership with Atkins, and uh, I should start by saying that I'm extremely grateful uh, to uh, colleagues at Atkins uh, for partnering us on this series. Uh, and also to the Building Centre uh, for hosting this series of events which uh, extend from now, um, uh, at the first event in the series, through till uh, July. Um, and uh, I'll say a bit more about that series uh, a bit later on, um, but please do, if you haven't yet booked your places at future events, uh, do think about doing so as soon as you can because they're filling up very fast. We do have a couple of laptops available and you can book them directly here today if you wish to. Um, so today, as I say, really follows the, the launch event that we held um, at a venue overlooking the park back in November. We had a fast, fantastic turnout there where we really talked about how we intend to tell the story of delivering the most sustainable, uh, or in the words of Jonathan Porritt, the least unsustainable uh, Olympic Games ever. Um, <clears throat> I suppose it depends if your glass is half full or not, doesn't it really? But the, um, I think we get the point. Um, uh, but it does also point to the fact that we do want this to be genuinely about learning lessons. And obviously there will be lots of positive lessons and there'll be lessons about things that we wish we'd done ever slightly differently, uh, that we would do differently if we did it again. And um, there's been a certain amount of um, discussion about how easy it is for people to talk about their involvement in the Olympics. We are very keen to uh, flush out as much as we possibly can and therefore your questions and the Q&A session that we have towards the end of this event uh, will be a very important opportunity for you to try and dig into some of the detail uh, that you're going to be hearing about. So, um, the, uh, let me see, um, that's me, that's the agenda. Uh, you're going to be hearing from um, uh, a spectrum uh, from across the, the, the project team here. So you've got Richard Arnold uh, representing the project sponsor from the ODA. Uh, Chris Bannister, uh, architect, partner at Hopkins. Um, Andrew Weir, director of expedition, uh, the engineers on this project uh, principally. Um, Vincent Busk, director at ISG. And Dan Epstein, uh, who I'm pleased to say has joined us quite late in the day to give a, a bit of an overview of how that all came together. Dan, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, was previously um, head of sustainability and regeneration at the ODA uh, and intimately involved in this and many other aspects of delivery. The velodrome has been called the most sustainable, the greenest of all the venues, so it seems a good place to start. Uh, it is a quite extraordinary achievement, as I'm sure you know and you will hear more. Um, it was also the first Olympic venue actually completed in February uh, 2011 uh, in 23 months, and that is 18 months before the start of the Games. Quite an extraordinary achievement, especially when you think about the scale of this. Uh, the velodrome, of course, is part of the broader uh, Velo Park, uh, which covers an area equivalent to about 20 football pitches, uh, and I think um, employed uh, something over 2,500 workers in its delivery. So a fairly large undertaking, uh, very well executed and delivered. But I'm sure, as I say, there are lessons that we should be uh, learning. So I think, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Richard, and with a pun that I know is going to be wearing very thin by July, uh, I'm going to be asking the speakers to pass the baton between them. Uh, so that I don't have to keep popping up and down like Zebedee and, and we'll get through the presentations and have plenty of time for your questions and answers. So without any further ado, over to Richard. Thank you very much. I'm going to start by giving an overview as to what the, um, the project was about, um, what we had to do, some of our key challenges, um, the successes, and then uh, some lessons learned that, 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 that came out of the whole exercise. So, um, starting with, uh, with what, what we had to do. Well, we had to deliver a, a venue for, uh, for the athletes for 2012. Um, I guess really with the velodrome when we first started back in 2005, it was kind of like um, quite an interesting thing to be doing, the velodrome, but not necessarily quite... Um, uh, not everyone knew what went on inside a velodrome. Then all our athletes went across to Beijing, won a, a shed load of medals, and suddenly they, they, every, everyone's an expert on cycling and, 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 and indeed what goes on inside there. Um, so British Cycling were a key partner with us all the way through and enormously helpful. 
We also um, had an interesting challenge in that the only element of the Olympic Park prior to the Games that had a sporting context was actually cycling. So there was an old uh, cycling centre on there called Eastway, uh, which had a one mile road circuit, this thing here, and then a whole trail of, of, of off-road um, facilities. And with that came a rather large, passionate and vociferous band of cyclists that felt that they had had a series of promises to have at least what they loved back again after the Games. So they were very keen to uh, push and uh, ensure that the ODA delivered back what they felt had been promised to them. We obviously also wanted to create a centre that was for cycling for every, everyone. So it's not just about the Victoria Pendletons and Chris Hoyes, it's all about getting people on bikes, getting the healthy, sustainable agenda through in that method and, and, and looking at all aspects of, of, of cycling. Um, and we also had a vision that had already been developed prior to the Olympic Games. So the land that this was being developed on was owned by the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, they actually came up with a concept for Velo Park that saw a velodrome going north of the A12 on Eaton Manor there and a whole series of, of, um, of, of road circuits and mountain bike trails, all on a 33 hectare site. Now that's part of the vision that was sold to the Eastway cyclists so suddenly when we were then faced with a much smaller site, that was again part of the challenge that we had to convince them that they were getting something smaller, but something that was as good. Um, turning to the successes, well really, um, it, it, it starts and finishes. We've got, we've got a fantastic building that's been delivered by the team. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about that from um, the architects, engineers, and, and indeed the contractors. So a, a, a great team effort in, in delivering that. Interestingly enough, when we were pulling the brief together, um, there was a, a great deal of uh, emphasis placed on the word iconic and not using the word iconic in the brief. Um, and uh, the chief executive from British Cycling, I remember saying at the time, we don't want an iconic venue. We want a, uh, a velodrome that's for cyclists. And if you use the word iconic, we'll get some piece of architecture that's no good to us at all. Um, so we spent a lot of time making sure that it was all about cycling, the sport and everything else, um, and, and being very clear in, in, in what we wanted. Ironically, we feel we've actually got the most iconic venue on the park at the end of it, and indeed that's backed up by the chief executive of, of British Cycling, who we were taking around at the end of the project, and stood there and said, you've given us everything we could have ever dreamed of in terms of a cycling facility, and we think we've got the best venue in the park as well. So um, there was a, a message in there, I think, somewhere as well. Um, in terms of the challenges that faced as well, it, it's, it's the usual balance, obviously, of cost, time, quality. Um, we, we had a pretty immovable deadline um, for, for, for this project, um, which was great in, in, in many respects in terms of it, it drove decision making. And ultimately, in the public sector, having that deadline uh, was, was great because um, people are, are great at having another committee or another meeting or another decision processing, and actually the deadline drove those, those decisions making. Um, the ODA at the start of the project came up with its, its priority themes, um, which was all about going back to the bid book and what was promised in Singapore behind the great games. So it was, the most, it was to be the greenest games, it was to be the most accessible games, the most inclusive games. Uh, likewise, we had to, um, we had to make sure that um, security, health and safety, local employment, all of those issues were addressed in order to deliver a great legacy. So we, at the start, we came up with, with these six priority themes, which were intended to go through everything. So all the briefs that we wrote, all the way we went about procuring and doing things, had to come back to these six priority themes. Quite easy to say, but quite another a challenge in effect to, to, to deliver. And I guess that comes back into... into the next side in terms of lessons learned. And I think one of the things that we felt we needed to do was, was, was to use a target-based approach. So rather than just turn around and say, well, we're going to have the greenest games um, and then leave it up to the teams to go and deliver us a, a green games, whatever that may be, we actually started putting some, some very specific um, targets in. So things such as 50% improvement on part L, 40% water reduction. 
looking at very specific type of, 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 of targets. <laughs> and that went through everything. So again, in terms of, in terms of local employment, when we looked at contractors, we, we gave them specific targets on what they had to do. When they were building, we actually looked at the type of material they had to use and how they used re uh, recycled materials. And in terms of that, we, we helped them with that process. So very much making it target driven, not least with the, the designers, but also contractors as well. Um, we went the, the way we went about procuring things. Um, we, we very deliberately, with our design team, said that we were um, going to get a team and not a scheme. So whilst we, we, we held a, uh, a design competition, it was all about getting uh, some ideas and, and but ultimately assessing the team. And we saw some absolutely beautiful and fantastic schemes coming forward. But ultimately, the team that we went ahead with was, was assessed as being the best team that worked together during that process. Um, in fact, the chair of the, the jury actually went back to our board and said, the Hopkins and, and Expedition BDSP team virtually came riding into the interview and then riding out again on their bicycles. It, it, it very much gave that, that sort of feel. So again, looking back at the procurement and the lessons coming out of that uh, w w was just very useful. Um, innovation, and, and ultimately not being afraid of innovation. Um, I think one of the uh, great sustainable stories that's come out of the velodrome that the engineers and, 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 uh, and, and architects will be able to tell you much more articulately than I can is all about the cable net roof and ultimately how we, we went about there. The original vision from the uh, engineers was to have a cable net roof. Um, as the design developed during the early stages due to various different advice coming back on cost, we then strayed away back to something a little bit more traditional in terms of a, a steel, um, steel truss system. So we, we, we kind of were, were looking at more a risk, risk averse approach, but it was actually bringing on board a contractor very early in the process, working with the design team and coming up with an innovative solution, cable not necessarily being innovative on its own, but actually looking at putting a solid roof over the top hadn't been done before. So coming to a, a fairly risk adverse organisation and saying, well, we're going to do something that's not been done before, but don't worry, it'll be all right, took a little bit of, um, of, of convincing, but ultimately it was the, absolutely the right decision for the project. Um, undoubtedly, we have benefited from having a clearly defined end use with this project. And it's not always been something that's um, happened on other projects on the Olympic Park. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we had a great, uh, great starting point was that we had an end user identified before we'd even started. So this was on Lee Valley, Lee, uh, Lee Valley land. They, as a body, were going to run this facility afterwards, and they had the funding and everything in place to do that. So for, for, for us as a delivery body to have an end user coming on board at the early stage saying, well, this is how we operate facilities, meant that that was in the brief from the outset. So it helped the team deliver a much, much better um, solution. Likewise, in terms of how we ended up delivering the, um, the overall concept that will be delivered after the Games, you've got this, the velodrome obviously delivers the Games, the, the BMX circuit that will get reconfigured. Um, it's not the best idea to send uh, uh, young riders down a BMX track that's been used for the Olympians, so that will need to be reconfigured a little bit. A one-mile road circuit and then seven kilometres of, of off-road trails. So that's all been in consultation with those cyclists in the outset. And I guess just as a final um, takeaway comment, um, I think really from the, from the client's perspective, our, our key message for, for, from this for, for industry is that Actually, the client's got a responsibility in all of this as well. It needs to show real leadership. Uh, and so on el elements such as sustainability, it's such an easy thing for, for clients to go out there and say, we want a green building or we want this, and then sort of like hide behind cost and, 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 and programme and everything else. So it's absolutely vital that, that the client shows the leadership to do that. And I know Dan later on will probably touch upon how, in particular, sustainability was driven through the, the client organisation. So I'm now going to pass over to, to Chris, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the architectural side. I'm going to just uh, spend my 10 minutes uh, talking to you a bit more about uh, our approach to uh, design, and in particular some of the concepts and things that we had 
uh, at, the, at the start of the, the process and how those actually sort of helped us uh, through uh, the whole uh, design process and have led to the, uh, the building that you see in front of you. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the challenges that we had, we were sort of given this task of actually delivering a, a first class uh, building but under uh, pressures of uh, cost and, uh, and, and time. And, uh, the, uh, but also we had to deliver something that uh, worked for the games itself, but also uh, worked after the, uh, the party was over uh, for Legacy. Uh, and because the Legacy uh, thing went on for effectively 50 years compared to the sort of two weeks of the game, for us, that was actually the sort of major, the major sort of consideration. Uh, and we were quite lucky uh, as a venue in that we had uh, a requirement for the seats uh, during the games, but also a requirement for 6,000 seats uh, in legacy. And as such, there were no major changes that we had to sort of make uh, to, the, uh, to the building envelope uh, itself. A lot of the things that, that changed were actually sort of stuff outside, outside that, that Richard's talked to you about in terms of the external uh, cycle uh, circuits and things. And we took as our sort of inspiration uh, at the competition stage was the, uh, the bicycle. And, and we really wanted that to sort of be represented in the, uh, the actual building itself, not, not really in any sort of, sort of mimicry uh, of the form, uh, shape of the bicycle, but more in terms of the approach. Uh, that all sort of starts uh, with the, uh, the track itself and the spectators. Uh, inside, taking the track, wrapping the spectators around it. Um, and one of the things that when we talked to the cyclists and things when we uh, started out was that uh, the, uh, they're very keen on having continuity of thought uh, around uh, the track itself. But that leads to a sort of gap in support, uh, which the cyclists don't like. So we sort of took uh, a sort of three rows of seats and things around the end of the building and use that to determine the sort of back line of the lower bowl of the seats. And around the outside of that, put a public concourse uh, that wraps around. And one of the things with uh, most velodromes is they end up being sort of fairly big boxes, because for most of the year, uh, it's just been used for training uh, inside. And we thought that actually be nice if people could just come up and, and look in. So we surrounded that concourse with glass so that people could look in, but also people could actually uh, look out. And then above that, uh, we put the rest of the uh, 6,000 seats. And that gave rise to this, the basic form uh, of the building, which on the north-south axis rises up very uh, high, where we've got the majority of the seats. But on the east-west axis, uh, there isn't much height requirement uh, above uh, the track. And as such, we could sort of pull down uh, the envelope of the building in order to minimize uh, the enclosed area, minimizing the requirement in terms of heating and ventilating, uh, but also minimizing the amount of built envelope that we needed to create. And that sort of gave us this curved uh, form, which is a very efficient uh, structural form. And when we came under, as we did, right from on, uh, massive pressure to cross, uh, what we did was to look at actually making that as uh, more efficient uh, uh, or as efficient as we possibly could as we went along. And as such, what we've ended up with is something that still uh, retains that double curve form because actually that is as efficient as we can get it. Uh, but we have sort of done various things uh, such as sort of removing the sort of more bulbous nature the bowl uh, and slimming that right down and effectively sort of shrink wrapping it uh, around the seats, which we think actually has sort of helped to enhance the overall concept that we uh, started out with, uh, but has also helped us greatly in terms of uh, meeting cost uh, targets. Uh, both, and that sort of effectively worked both outside uh, and inside the building. And really in order to do that, what we've had to do is to sort of integrating uh, the architecture uh, with engineering and not really just the structural engineering, but also uh, the M&E uh, engineering and things as well. And looking at actually sort of pulling in uh, 
the ventilation air in th through the, uh, the lower part of the bowl, uh, where it then seating, uh, mobilizing the thermal mass uh, concrete uh, seating decks, passing into uh, the main space and then back out. And the shape of the roof, in terms of uh, the structural efficiency uh, of the structure, but also uh, in terms of helping to move the air around and the air naturally flows up the underside of the roof and out at the high points uh, at the top of the building. And I should say that, I mean, the building is designed uh, to work uh, with natural ventilation, so about 70% of the year uh, it is naturally ventilated, uh, in particular in summer. The plant inside the building, uh, which is located in this area underneath the seats, but that is there really more to do with providing heat uh, into the building. Uh, one of the things that the cyclists are very keen on is uh, riding around at very high temperatures, about sort of 28 degrees, and as such, the building envelope is very well insulated with about 300 mil of insulation uh, on the roof and in the facade. Uh, but they also don't like drafts, so we need to be able to heat the building up and avoid that. Uh, the, there is underfloor heating in the infield uh, and on the concourse, but that really only can get us up to sort of 18, 20 degrees. And so the mechanical plant that's located underneath here uh, is, has a series of jets on the front of the upper tier that you can see here. And that is designed to actually jet uh, warm air out and mix it up well above uh, the cyclist's heads there in order to get temperatures up uh, to 28 degrees uh, during competitions uh, without causing drafts down on the track itself. The other thing uh, for us was lighting. Uh, for the, the games itself, there was a sort of yes, have a requirement for blackout. Uh, but going into legacy, uh, with the, the, tra the, the venue being used mainly for training, uh, the aim was to try and minimize as much as possible uh, the ongoing running costs of the building. And one way of doing that was to sort of cut down uh, on any artificial lighting requirement. Uh, so there's a whole series of roof lights that were incorporated in the roof in order to provide uh, a good level of lighting even lighting uh, across the track itself uh, in order to allow the building to be run cost. And this is a picture taken in December uh, showing uh, the light side. Uh, the roof lights themselves actually incorporate two levels uh, of diffusion, uh, two white interlayers uh, in order to prevent uh, sunlight uh, when the sun does come out, uh, causing problems in terms of patches of sunlight on the track. In terms of uh, what time, uh, not a lot, I think, really, is probably the answer. Uh, I mean, I think we spent a lot of time looking at how we could cut out a minimized amount of uh, material and things in the building, which I think is entirely the right thing to do. Uh, I think what we would probably spend more time looking at next time is maybe the bits of material we had left uh, as to uh, what the environmental impacts of all those materials were, and maybe uh, look into that in uh, a bit more detail. But I think really uh, for us, uh, the main really is uh, team collaboration, not just between uh, the various designers, but also uh, working with the contractor uh, in order to make sure that we maximized uh, the everything we, we could uh, and design integration. And at this point, I'm going to hand over uh, to Andrew The one thing that we were very keen on doing is looking at how can we take the evolution of the bicycle from the, the penny farthing to, the, to this racing bike and really apply it to um, a stadia where, as Chris has said, on, on the, the racing bike, all the material has very, very um, been thought about and everything is in exactly the right place, material choice, there was no fat on there. And so our challenge was really how do you bring that onto, onto a building? And I think as a structural engineer, we had three things we could bring to, bring, to the, bring to the project. And the first one is, I think, is the very traditional one of material choice in terms of sustainable material. And that on the velodrome, we've done that by using very much in the same way as other people on the, uh, the park. We have um, 
high cement replacement of the concrete, we have FSC timber, all the usual things uh, which you expect to bring to a project. Uh, but the, the, the next thing I think we brought to the project was really, going back to the analogy of the bike, was putting the right material in the right place. So, and it, well, to, to non-engineers that always sounds very simple, but when you go through a lot of building design, you realize that a lot of material is, is wasted in standard building design. Um, but so what we wanted to do was, was to select the right material and the right choice. So for the roof, it sounds very obvious, but we used lightweight materials. We used high strength steel and we used timber. And then for the bowl underneath, we used structural steelwork, which is very formable. And you can make sure you put exactly the right material exactly where you want it. And down in the foundations, where well, all we really wanted was weight to try and counteract the forces that came from the cables. We used concrete, but we didn't need strength, so we used a relatively low strength concrete. So really everything was doing exactly what it needed to do. But probably even more than that, the third part, I think, as a structural engineer we could bring to the project was making sure that the whole form of the building was working structurally efficient. So as Chris has already said, the building was optimized not only for architecture, it was optimized for environmental performance and also it was optimized for structure. So the idea of shrink wrapping the building and pulling the roof down onto the accommodation, so where we had the seats up high and where we, where we didn't have the seats, you end up with this double curve. So that's very much minimizing the environmental, environmental envelope. But for us, we've got this very efficient uh, double curve shape. So you can imagine the least efficient form is a, is a flat plate. If you then curve it into an arch, it's more efficient, but even more efficient if you can get this sort of idea of this double curvature. And again, as Chris has said, the, the integration between the architecture and the service and the, and the, and the, sort of the general architecture, so this is how the forces from the roof get down through the structure, down into the foundations. And you can see that mirrors very much the form of the building. So we use the front for the seating, we use the inner in bit here for the servicing, and then the architectural facade. And when you put that all together, you, you can see where the real benefit comes. So this is a comparison of uh, some of the venues on the park and also um, and other, other venues. So the velodrome is here, and this is embodied carbon. And unfortunately, comparison between stadiums is actually quite complex because you tend to whether you measure it by the area of the roof or the floor or by seat. But whichever metric you use, you can really see that the velodrome is really one of the better buildings, and it's probably only matched by the um, Sydney uh, main stadium, which is a slightly different structure. So Richard alluded to it. The, one of the challenges we had was using the, was introducing this idea of a, a so-called novel form, the cable net, which is obviously used quite extensively around the world. So it's not really novel, but it was bringing this form to the, uh, the British construction market. Um, so we had a cable net roof in the competition, as Chris showed you the, the competition scheme. But very early on in the scheme, probably about stage B, the client uh, with the cost advice was very much saying that the cable net would come out more expensive than the other options. So the project was, I wouldn't say derailed, but at stage B, we had to switch from the cable net to a whole series of steel arches. So if you can imagine these cables, these were being replaced by steel arches with a span of about 130 meters. Um, so rather than using pairs of 36 millimeter cables, we were swapping that to 1.2 meter deep steel beams. And the outcome of that in terms of embodied energy or in carbon, you can see the competition scheme here. We had a, a fairly decent, I mean, forget the numbers, but just look at the relative values. That when we went to the value engineered scheme, should we say, the, uh, the carbon went up. But then as we got ISG on board and who backed the idea of a cable net, we ended up with the end value being much lower. So really, the progress of the project should have been like this, but the value engineering took us on this sort of diversion. And the challenge to us as, a, as the, the designers was really, we spent probably a third of the projects looking at the scheme we weren't going to build in the end. Another challenge is when you start paring things down and taking material off, you, you suddenly find that the building, in terms of the metrics, the design pops out of the sort of standard building codes. And I won't go through dynamics, I'm sure it's not dear to many of your hearts, but one of the uh, standard rules of uh, stadia is that the, the, the stand shouldn't vibrate at uh, less than 3.5 hertz. And that's just a, that's from basic standard theory of a normal um, stadia. 
And one of the challenges we had was by taking all the material out and, and connecting the whole building together, the building was much uh, less stiff effectively, so it vibrated at a number at 2.4 hertz. Now, the easy option would have been simply to chuck about four or 500 tonnes of steel back into the project. If you consider there's about 1,000 tonnes in the whole project, we could have put 40% extra to bring that number back up to uh, 3.5, which is an extremely easy way of doing it. But what we decided to do was there had been published a new uh, methodology of analysing buildings or analysing stadia that we, we adopted. And we were very fortunate our Cat3 checkers or our third-party engineers who are Mark McDonald also bought into this, um, which meant through a lot more analysis, we managed to justify the 2.4 hertz. So really, the challenge is when you're out there and doing buildings that aren't normal, you really have to start looking at alternative methods and making sure you get everyone on board. So in terms of lessons learned, I think I've worked on a number of projects where everyone says they're an integrated design team, and really that means they meet every Thursday afternoon to talk about design. I mean, that is not integrated design. And the next step is now everyone has BIM, and they say integrated designs, oh, I've modelled it on BIM. Uh, th th this is quite clearly not the case. Integrated design is something that needs to go through the whole process. And I think the roof, uh, you know, in terms of environmental performance, is very good. But I, what I still think is it's something that's probably about... 400, 500 millilitres deep, we have structure, architecture, environmental engineer, rain screen. It's a very, very um, good example of how, how things can integrate together. Another one is clearly getting a contractor on board early. This whole sort of diversion route through the steel arches simply wouldn't have happened had the contractors been brought on earlier. And in many ways, we could argue that um, ISG were brought on a board about stage D, so it's, it's, it could have been a lot worse than it was, but particularly when you're looking at non-common forms, please get contractors in. I mean, they, they are the experts. We, as a design team, we can go so far, but you need cost advice and you need construct, construction advice, and that really can only come from the experts. And uh, a final lesson learned for me was really, um, it's a real bugbear that we were very fortunate on the Olympic Park and we had a sustainable team and we had a number of people that we could talk to in terms of getting material selection advice. But you come out back into the real world, it's very, very difficult to choose, or you can choose a sustainable material, but then when it goes to market, someone says, that's not available, that's too expensive. So as an industry, we really need to move to a position where it is very, very easy for your average engineer, your average architect to specify low carbon material and really just taking it to a, the, the key well, the industry takeaway, as we've been asked to say it, was really please do consider when you look at you know, low carbon <coughs> buildings, it's not just energy in use. I mean, building control and all these things try and get the energy down for the, the in use, but the, the, the body carbon is also very, very important. And uh, please consider your structural engineer because he really can quite help very strongly in this. At which point, I'll pass to Vince. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, wonderful title, but really what it means is, is, is uh, my job is to take the risk out of delivery, and you, you've seen quite a bit of risk as we've looked at it there. Oops, let's go that the right way. Okay, so how did it work out? Well, what we've got to do is to take these wonderful designs um, and try and turn that out into the end result. So one of the things that uh, hasn't been mentioned yet um, is that uh, this velodrome actually had 10 times less material than the Beijing one. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at um, building or constructing what has, been, what has been designed so far. You've heard that it's been won in the design competition and we, we took it on at stage C, if you're familiar with, with stage C. And that really consisted of six drawings. So the emphasis has already been on, uh, made about getting the contractor on board early. Um, and I can't really stress that enough because that enables us then to try and get the whole concepts of uh, what the, uh, the outcome is, what the stakeholders are looking for, what the, the target um, of the financial target, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et so we had to, if you like, get into a position where we had to come to the table and get an initial target price to build what was 
the concept of the design so far. Uh, and that we got into, into position by December 2008. We then got to stage E by uh, March 2009 and we finally agreed the target price um, or the final target price which the client signed off in May 2009. So let's have a look at where, where we managed to get some success through it. As you can see there, there's, there's, uh, there was uh, 48,000 square metres of material was excavated to create the bowl and that's enough to fill about 19 Olympic swimming pools. Um, there was 400, as it says there, uh, 80 precast concrete driven piles. Um, one of the things that uh, um, is uh, uh, dealing with contaminated ground is you've got to look at the options um, as to the type of pile that you're going to put in. So precast means that there's less spoil which is um, pulled back out the ground so the contamination remains where it's supposed to be um, and you're, you're looking at the whole piling structure and how you can get that through. Then we looked at um, the precast ter terracing. There was 3,500 3 units in the precast territory and um, I think when we looked at it, I, there was only two units were actually the same. So there was a whole, to get this concept or to put this concept in place was to, to have a look at how we could actually manufacture that uh, and get those um, in a prefabrication form and brought into site so um, they could be actually lifted into place to form the structure. Then as you can see, um, we started to put the structural steelwork in place, which is manufactured in Bolton, uh, Lancashire. Um, and the steel framework, that actually included uh, reused pipework with 60% uh, of the uh, um, minimum of recycled content actually went into the, uh, the pipework there. And now comes the, the innovation. <laughs> Um, we've already talked about how it went in the design initially and then got taken out of the design. Why do you think that was? Well, the whole risk of this concept of putting a cable net roof on ha hadn't been done in this, uh, in ma this magnitude in the UK. So it was, um, how, how can we do this? What are the parameters of actually putting up a cable net roof? Um, how, where has it been successfully done around the world and what were the lessons learned from where they did it before? Well, one of the things that we had to do was when the decision was made, we had to actually procure the cable net um, and it was manufactured in Germany um, and we actually had to procure the uh, very, very early on so that the cables could actually be uh, strung out as you can see in the factory there. Uh, and splayed to all the correct lengths. We then had to work out if we were going to hang a cable net roof like that, how was the roof structure going to work? What, what were the loadings going to be on the roof structure? Um, within, these, within, within the 10 minutes that we've got, um, basically as, as the, the cable was on, and, and Andrew showed you some photographs of it lying on the floor lifted up, you've got a structure that gets pulled out as the cable is tensioned or, or pulled back in again and then when it's loaded with the cassettes on the outside, it pulls the structure back out again. So the, the tolerances and the movements were quite, quite, had to be quite clearly defined on how we could get those right tolerances and where it would sit within the building. So that was a challenge on its own. The, the outcome of it was that um, by moving to cable net, we um, saved about a million pound in uh, the purchase of steel. So by, by going down this route, it actually knocked a million pound off the cost uh, alone on the steel structure. Now, one of the things that also came in with this is, is how do we construct this safely? What, what, do, we, what do we look at um, regarding um, the safety of putting it up? And, and it was quite easy, really, because one of the things is as the cable net was lying on the floor, it enabled us to, to net all the cable as it was lying on the floor. So as it got pulled up, there was automatically a safety net underneath it but we still needed to employ um, one of the high risk activities within the construction industry, which is rope access. And I can remember when, uh, when the rope access guys actually came over and started to work, that there were some phone calls into the ODA 
about unsafe working on the velodrome. Um, and it focused a little bit of attention uh, as to how we controlled the hierarchy of risks, etc., to actually build this. Um, but when you spoke to the guys that were doing it, you will find that these were uh, adrenaline junkies and, and people that would climb uh, Mount Everest and people like that for sport. So we, we had the, once the high, most highly skilled guys that you could possibly get to actually put that structure up and to make it safe. And then we looked onto how do we load, load that um, structure up now and how do we put those cassettes in. Well, it was, it was a matter really of uh, common sense. How, how, would you, how would you come across a roof which is strung like a, te um, a tennis racket uh, in, in, a, in a safe and um, sustainable way, if you like, regarding health and safety wise? So that was quite easy. We, we had a walkway all the way around and we just went across with the netting uh, and put the, um, the timber cassettes in and then put the, uh, the roof over the top of it. And as you can see there, it, they were all manufactured off-site, brought in and lifted straight in, slotted straight into place. Even with the um, roof lights, they were exactly the same. The natural lighting that you've already seen on the previous slides um, were lifted straight into place and covered over until such times as they needed to go. So then we get to the, the external facade. How, how, how do you put in an uh, external facade? Well. One of the interesting things with this, it, it was, can we manufacture it in a cassette form and lift cassettes up into, into, a, and into a given matrix, which would make life easier, which, which means le, um, the wastage of materials um, would, be, would be cut down. So that's what we did. We put it into, into cassette form. It was all lifted up, um, as you can see in that thana, uh, manner there. Uh, and how did we help the, uh, the rest of industry while we did it? Well, um, if you're not aware, the, the part of the content which finishes off and oils that wonderful timber structure that's gone up there contains rhubarb oil. So what we did is we actually helped the rhubarb industry of the UK um, by having that oil. So, on to the closely guarded secret of the track. Um, if you're not aware, the, the track designers is a closely guarded secret and the individual that built this ROM web um, sat there through the whole of the design in the middle of the, uh, in, in the middle with his laptop and watched everything that was going on to ensure that it went in correctly. So 356 glue lamb track trusses manufactured in this country all went into place, which was a challenge on its own to get the curvature right. I think we had about 36 carpenters that we're actually putting it in, in um, piece by piece as it went in. Um, sustainably sourced Siberian pine was used for it um, and it supported 56 kilometers of surface timber laid from track to surface. And what we did is um, so that we involved all the workforce, we had a, a little pack at the end when we finished the velodrome and every contractor, individual operative that actually worked on the workforce um, of, of the whole Olympic Games got a, a, an offcut of the track with a stamp on it to uh, ensure that um, it went through. Uh, they had something to show their children and grandchildren. Right, takeaway for industry. For me, it's already been talked about teamwork. If you are a cyclist and you understand the cycling around the velodrome, um, that was the three-man trivial pursuit. And if you, if you, if you see the the, the, the pursuit round the track, you always get a front rider and the two riders tucking behind and at a given moment in time they, they interchange. Well, that's what it was like building the velodrome. Um, a client that was switched on, uh, that, that ticked the boxes, understood working with uh, first class architectural practice and engineering practice that said, right, okay, let's, let's have a look at the challenges, let's work the challenges out. Um, and as a team, you're able to deliver. But the biggest test for us all is what happens in July, you know. Um, they've been had a look at it, Chris Hoy's been, and they've all cycled around it for, for hours and hours already. They, 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 the actual cyclists are saying it's the best track in the world that they've ever cycled on. So uh, the, the story will end if we get a bumper crop of medals um, in July and uh, <laughs> we, we will see. <laughs> 
we will see. And over to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, I was, as Paul said, the head of sustainability for uh, three and a half years at the Olympics, and um, I think this was the most extraordinary project to work on. I'd just like to start, before I start, I'd like to thank Paul, but also Christina and Anna for putting on what I think is going to be a really interesting set of um, seminars around lessons learned, because there certainly are a lot of lessons to be learned from the Olympics, and it'd be a great shame if we didn't. <laughs> the velodrome is just one project of a whole suite of projects, and not just the big stadia, but also um, the landscape, the utilities, the, the, um, the services, the, the demolition. I mean, there's a huge amount, six billion pounds of worth of projects in here. And the velodrome is just one of those projects. And the challenge for us was really to create an overarching strategy, sustainability strategy, that would touch on all of the different types of works that were going on, but also that would really capture the imagination of the public and the industry, and particularly NGOs and others, who are really want, who wanted to make sure that this was the most sustainable games ever built. You know, so we were working in a goldfish bowl. We were had at one le at one side we had um, NGOs saying we want zero carbon, we want no water use in this park, all, all sorts of fantastically impossible things. And another, you know, let's just get this thing built and let's focus on program and budget. And we were trying to balance all of that. And we were trying to at the same time create briefs, therefore, that would be challenging for industry but wouldn't be impossible to meet. We always wanted to ensure that we were going to work within the pos what was possible, but let's push best practice. So let's go from what in London, I think at the time, you know, most projects were being asked to, to reduce their carbon emissions by 20%. Let's push it to 50%. I mean, there were debates, seriously, around 100%, and we just felt that was going to go far too far. <coughs> but it was, for us, about creating the sorts of briefs that weren't going to tell the many different design teams, and particularly this design team, how to do their job. It was all about performance standards. It was about saying, this is what we'd like to achieve. Now let's find the best people in the business, and that's from the, the client through to the uh, project manager, the client manager, Richard, through to uh, the design teams, the contractors. Let's find the teams that can help us deliver that. And it was then driving that, therefore, through from a clear strategy, a set of targets, uh, the design process into procurement, really important. Often, you know, we have these aspirations. They don't get driven into procurement. Um, and therefore, nothing actually happens. Or if it does, you have to pay a fortune afterwards because it becomes a bit of an afterthought. Into the construction process, and you've heard from Vince. And then into legacy, which I would actually argue after the games is the big, will be the big decider about whether this has all been a success or not. The success, I suppose, for this particular building is that it is widely regarded by many. I think Jack Pringle wrote in Building Design the other day, but um, many, many people have said this is probably, from a sustainability point of view, the jewel in the crown. And not just because it meets accessibility standards and environmental standards and um, you know, health and safety standards, etc., but also because it's an incredibly beautiful building. It's a pavilion in the park. It'll, it really, its context is extraordinary. The, what it will do and the way it relates to the kind of the wider area is really interesting. So from aesthetically, it's, 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 it's fantastic. It also, from a, from, a, from, a, from a cyclist point of view, you know, the cyclists have been around it and have really enjoyed it. And from a spectator point of view, it's an amazing place to go and sit and watch sport. And that's in many ways thanks to, I think, the di design team, the project team that we had on this, on, uh, working on here. I think it's really, really hard to find design teams that work in truly integrated ways. I think, as, um, <coughs> as Chris said, or, 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 or as Andrew said, you know, often that just means sort of sitting together on a Thursday afternoon and having a few sort of banters. Here, we had a truly integrated design team, a design team that from the very beginning had aspirations, a very clear vision. And yes, there were sort of disputes and disagreements of, you know, and, 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 and details that had to be resolved through that process, but there was always the opportunity, there was always this sort of strong idea about where everybody wanted to get to. And so there wasn't huge compromises that meant so often, yeah, oh, let's just take that line out of the cost plan, let's just take all the PVs off, or let's just take the, you know, the, 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 the heating system out. You know, there was an understanding uh, that, that there was a much more subtle way of, of reducing 
um, costs through this program and dealing with design changes that inevitably happen as you go through value engineering. So there, there was a sort of DNA, there was a real sort of sense of you know, an understanding and a way of working in which the design teams, the, the whole design team relied on, on one another to make things work. So you've seen this in graph form. You know, we started off with a competition scheme with 1,600 tonnes of, of, of carbon embodied in it. It went down, or steel embodied in it. It went right down to 1,000, 2,000. But it went up first through the flat scheme and then the reduced competition scheme. Um, as a result of the sort of some of the changes that, that, that occurred, you know, cost consultants saying you couldn't do the cable nets uh, roof uh, cost effectively, the contractor coming in and saying, actually, we think we can do it more cost effectively. We can reduce materials, we can reduce time, we can save on the overall budget. And so it's really interesting, that sort of process. But that's what happens with innovation. I think you know, a lot of people get scared of innovation. There's a tendency to revert back to the, you know, what we all know. The, the, the attempt to sort of push industry a bit further is, is incredibly challenging. You need that determination and that confidence and from the whole team, it's extraordinary how one person or one small part of the whole process can actually scupper all of this. If the right contractor hadn't come in at this point and said, actually, you know, program, program management team, we think, or cost consultant, we can do this in another way, this wouldn't have happened. We'd have ended up with something like this scheme. You know, so it, it is, it does require all sorts of people in that process to work together to deliver sustain, a sustainability uh, or a sustainable project, a beautiful project, a sort of project that's true to its, to its objectives. We <coughs> asked for all sorts of things to be achieved. So here we have our targets. We set targets for every project um, across the park. And here's what we actually achieved. This is the most energy efficient building. It went, we set a standard to reduce, to, to improve over Partel, to improve uh, performance in all buildings by 15% over Partel. This building has achieved a 31% improvement. And that's because it really, the whole integration between the architecture, the structures, and the um, building management services kind of worked in such a way that they, they really made the most of lighting. They really made the most of the natural ventilation of the heating systems. You know, the whole shape, the, the whole, the, the, the form, the volume, everything contributed to an extraordinarily efficient building. And it's the same with water reduction, with, with virtually everything um, on, on this list of targets. You know, the, the, they, they really understood, integrated, and designed from first principles to create an extraordinarily efficient building, that bicycle of a building, if you like. And it's the same with recycled aggregates, healthy materials, um, right through the list. I mean, it's an extraordinary achievement, and um, we've looked at the achievements for all of the buildings, and this is why people, I think, say this is the most sustainable building, because this is the one that's achieved the most, or exceeded the standards uh, by, um, <laughs> uh, most successfully. Um, and I think the, 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 the biggest success, though, as I said before, is that this building, and it's not just a building, actually, it's a whole cycle facility, including off-road, uh, on-road cycling, BMX, uh, training for kids, <coughs> was, is the one building that's really been designed from legacy first. It had that client. It was really fortunate, as Richard said, to have the end user, the end manager, the end owner, involved right from the beginning in making decisions about the, about the design. And so the success will be if the communities, the four communities around this area, but also the wider community and elite athletes all get to use this stadium, this, this new venue, um, actively. It's been, you know, many people on the project and of the project have, have said it's an incredible building. It's been awarded all sorts of awards. It's won the most awards as well, um, uh, public awards, all sorts of awards. It was unfortunate with the Sterling Prize. Um, I think it was the po People's Poll winner. Um, politics gets in the way sometimes. But, um, but it is, but, uh, you know, I, th I think many of you think it, it whatever. But the, it's, it's won all sorts of other fantastic awards. And I, and I think that, you know, those, 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 you know, those are, are experts telling us that it's a fantastic scheme. The challenge is, Briam is really not the right tool to drive innovation. I think BRIAM was used as a sort of ch uh, as a tick box exercise in the end to, you know, it was something we asked for, and I think it's very useful, BRIAM, because it's an independent, uh, externally assessed um, uh, target. 
But actually here, it didn't really drive innovation. And what's really odd about it is that whilst this building, from a, an embodied carbon point of view and from a, a carbon efficiency point of view and from a water uh, reduction point of view, is by far and away the most efficient, um, other buildings um, uh, achieve BRIAM excellent far more easily than this building. So there's a sort of, there's, there, 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 there are issues about that. And I think that's just in the nature of trying to introduce a, a one, one type of system for, for all types of buildings. They're just not broad enough, they're not able, and they're not, they're not fine-grained enough to be able to recognize real achievement sometimes. Innovation, we've talked a bit about this, you know, this almost didn't happen, it did happen. There is a real concern about risk and innovation on all projects. Um, the, so getting innovation and risk built into projects requires you know, all sorts of people within the project to work with you. We spent a huge amount of time in my team, the sustainability team, trying to push and introduce uh, all sorts of innovation, largely from the supply industry, but also from, from, from others. And we were successful sometimes, not always successful. This is, I think this is one of those projects where we really were successful, but we could have easily fallen down. So it's getting that innovation in requires quite a lot of bottle quite a lot of commitment, quite a lot of leadership. Richard talked about leadership. That leadership and that commitment from the Olympic board all the way down was extraordinary. Getting really good communications was really important. This isn't just about three or four people making a load of decisions. This is about the leadership at the top. It's about the design team getting it right, the contractor coming on board, all the subcontractors buying in, and the 10,000 people working in the end on the Olympic Park and on projects like this kind of uh, being part of that whole uh, uh, value, uh, that, that whole drive towards a sustainable, beautiful, fantastic, you know, uh, project that we can all be proud of in Britain. So that communication is incredibly important. There were all sorts of little interesting things we did to capture and to reward people on the park. Um, what, we do, what would we do different next time? Um, I think, actually, this project is one of those projects, one of those rare projects where that alignment between all of the players was right. And I think we would try to do the same again. There was a sort of, in, in some ways, it was kind of, it, it, was, it was a real serendipity. There was a lot of luck in this. You know, other projects perhaps weren't quite so lucky. But I think taking a lot of the lessons that you've heard before, getting the brief right, getting the targets right, getting the performance requirements right, getting the right team, getting a team that really gets all of this, you know, being prepared to sort of, uh, to, to test to use new ways of testing buildings, you know, putting your liability and your indemnity on the line, you know, getting a contractor who's on board. I think those things are really critical for success if we really want to push the building, uh, the, the, the whole building industry further. So I think we would try to be, um, so we, here we have a building that, that, that demonstrates best practice. I think we would, I would next time, I would like to push the standards even further. I think they've demonstrated that you can surpass all of the standards that we set. I think we particularly introduce embodied carbon, but I think we would also now recognize that we can go for 30% improvement over Partel. There's a bunch of other kind of lessons that I think we've learned from this building that you can fine tune and get the building right, but you'll only do it if you get the right team. So I think appointing the right team from the client, well, the client doesn't appoint themselves, but get, getting the clients, getting the right attitude from the client, but then getting the right pro program management team, getting the right contractors is really, really critical. So I think understanding that and getting that right is important. And I think the last thing, my kind of take home message is that sustainability just doesn't happen on its own. It's not one of those things that we all sort of, you know, that, that, that we deliver very easily. It requires real rigor, real determination, real focus, real knowledge, and, and, and real excellence in, you know, in, in, in that team. So, you know, if you want to make it happen, you really need to be um, working hard on it. Thank you. sourced Siberian pine. I suspect there's a big story to that for the cycle trout. Why Siberia? Um, and how easy was it to get something sustainably sourced from Siberia? Thank you. And there was another question. Yep, there we go. Uh, Duncan Young, Lend Lease. Um, just wanted to ask a question. I, as I look down the list, I don't see too many cost consultants. So we know they have the ability to derail things pretty quickly. Uh, how are we um, getting the learning to them? Thank you very much. Okay, so, so let's take those questions. So the, so the question about what's the legacy in terms of the overall Olympics movement and looking ahead 20 years maybe, what's our vision? How, how sustainable can Olympics get? Uh, question about Siberian pine, how sustainable is it? 
Um, and a uh, and, uh, question about cost consultants. What are the lessons for those? So, so Dan, do you want to kick off? Uh, I, mean, I, I agree with Jonathan Porrier. I think you know, the Olympics is inherently unsustainable, I would say, as a kind of, you know, the idea that you bring 20,000, 40,000 press actually all together, you bring um, 20,000, you know, athletes and the athletes' teams, you know, people from all over the world, you have this huge party, you spend, you know, billions of pounds on, on it over a, you know, a three-week period. At some level, is isn't, but at another level, you know, the idea that you bring, you know, over 200 countries of the world, um, communities together in one place to celebrate, you know, a, and a huge and amazing kind of event um, around, you know, shared values, etc. is extraordinary. And I think the world needs that sort of thing. Um, I think London probably got it as, you know, as right as you can get it in the sense that um, Ken Livingstone and, you know, others were very, very determined that when the Olympics came to London, it would come to, it would only come to London if it was going to drive, be a catalyst for change. The change that occurred in, in East London, in the Lower East Side, has been, it had been, um, had, had, had been uh, an ambition for a long, long time. And, so, and, the, and it, would never, it really would have taken 30, 40 years to have happened if it had ever happened in, that, in this sort of way. There are things that happen when you, you know, there are issues around mega projects like this. But I think we were, we were aware of those. So, you know, the fact that it's been used as a catalyst for huge change is, is, is a very good thing. Um, and I, and, I, and, I, and I would hope that other Olympics, well, you know, the thing we say to Rio and that Rio is, and the mayor of Rio is very aware of is that, you know, the, the games either get you, either uses you or you use it. And so they're very determined that they use the games. You need extraordinarily good planning to do that. Um, whether they get the formula right is, a, is another issue. Um, so I, it's, it's sort of in the balance. I think if you can use that, that interest, that, that, inv that, that investment to bring about, you know, change in, in cities, to create sustainable cities, then I think we're doing very well. If it, if it just becomes a, you know, a huge jamboree and, and when the caravan leaves, you have all of the problems to deal with that they do in Athens, um, then it's certainly unsustainable. But um, you know, it, there's a lot to learn from Barcelona. We learned from Barcelona, we learned from Sydney. Um, you know, hopefully, we've learned something from Beijing and from Athens, actually. And I hope that the Olympic movement sort of pushes you know, not only the kind of the target-driven sustainability criteria, but also the kind of the bigger legacy criteria, um, and then we'll have success. Thanks, Dan. Uh, who, who would like to pick up the question about the chain of custody for Siberian pine? Is that one for uh, Andrew or, or Vincent? Sh sh or shall I, shall I start with sure. why Siberian pine, probably, to begin with, because that's effectively prescribed by us on, on Vince and ISG. Um, Siberian pine is, is uh, the preferred type of timber from our, our track designer. Uh, they like a, a softwood now, in, in particularly internal tracks, um, because uh, obviously it's far more sustainable, it's more malleable in terms of getting the bends, so you can have thicker laths, so it lasts a bit longer. <coughs> um, the pine in Siberia, because it's in the Arctic Circle, grows particularly tall and strong with little knots in it, and therefore that's really why it's, um, it's, uh, it's that particular type of, of, of pine. Um, Ultimately, we, with Dan and, and the various uh, ODA <coughs> teams, worked with the, 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 the mills in, in, um, in Siberia to ensure it was FSC certified, and then just the chain of custody. So we, in, 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 um, uh, we had a, a timber panel, so <laughs> ISG had to go to a, one of our people on the timber panel so that they could then get the timber from source, take it all the way through the milling process to the UK, onto the... Uh, onto the Olympic Park through a single chain of custody, so we always knew where it was. Do you want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I mean, talk? most of the time, um, we, we spent quite a lot of time talking to um, the FSC organisation, and most of the time we relied on FSC and their accredited certifiers to tell us whether um, timber was coming from sustainable sources or not, and we know that there are all sorts of problems with, with that process. Um, so we, we actually employed, I can't, I, I can't remember their names, but we employed a particular certifier who also do undercover investigations into these sorts of issues um, to actually help us source um, woodlands and, wo and suppliers who um, they believed had integrity. You know, in, a, in an environment which is it's incredibly difficult to, you know, it is, it's, it's the back and beyond. Um, so, you know, we, we took... You know, first of all, we went to FSC to kind of, you know, to understand how rigorous their 
certification process was for Siberian timber. We understood that that's what we required. We took, mm. a, we took a particular cert, uh, company to find the right, the right suppliers, and then we passed those on to the, to the timber supply panel. But it, you know, so it took a lot more work than, than, than usual, and we were very, um, you know, and we, we, were, we were very aware of the, of the sorts of issues we were getting involved with. Thank you. Uh, so turning to this question about the cost consultants, I mean, you gave us a very graphic example with the, the effect of value engineering on, on the embodied carbon, but also actually on the cost of delivering a structure that took you back to something that performs even better, both from a financial and an and a embodied carbon point of view in the end. So, so uh, what else could you say are, are the lessons for the, for the cost consultants here? I think for, for our side, it really was just getting the, the guys that know what it's all about in as, as early as possible. I mean, it, I t we tend to work on projects now when cost consultants keep the specialists away because they want to keep the market lively when they go to market, which is fine in one way, but it just is completely missing out um, the answer. I, I think there just needs to, uh, there needs to be an understanding that when you're slightly off the realms, so if you're building a, a you know, building in central London, you know how much steel is, you know how much concrete is, it's a very basic thing, but when you're doing innovative structures, you, everyone has to accept that you need the collective team whether it's engineering, architecture, or cost advice to get the right answer. And the, the cost consultant was really, in the early days, was just looking at it in terms of the cost of materials. So it was kind of cost of standard steel against this cost of this, you know, esoteric cable uh, thing. And whilst we're using a thousand tons less of steel in the cables, the problem was that the, the cost per unit was a lot higher. And so looking at that and saying, well, you know, by the time you add in the risk factor, he was kind of pricing the cable net a lot more. What the advantage of getting ISG on board was that they sort of looked at it and said, well, hang on a minute, there are other advantages that the cost consultant is not taking account of, which is mainly to do with program, because, because they could lay it out on the ground, do all the work on the ground, lift it up, got rid of any need for scaffolding and temporary structures and things, uh, sort of a massive saving on temporary structures, which hadn't been really properly costed, uh, and also big saving on program, sort of took about three months off the program, all of that added up to, to produce a saving. And uh, it's only by getting that real sort of advice that we managed to address that. So I, th I, think, um, I think it's easy for us to all sound like we're bashing the cost consultant, and, 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 and I don't think necessarily that was the case. Um, as, I th as Chris has said, the, the, the advice in the early stages was, was, was leading us a certain direction. I think some credit is actually deserved towards the contractor ISG who actually were prepared to look at what was quite an innovative solution. There were other contractors we were talking to that quite frankly would have looked at that <coughs> and said there's a huge risk premium on that. So actually the, the advice from the cost consultant would have been entirely consistent with all of that. So it, it, it was kind of inherent with the team dynamics from, 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 from the contractor in that respect. So I don't want you all to be taken away that we're, we're, we're bashing cost consultants <laughs> from this, but you know, it's just, just the way that the actual project went, really. Quick but, word but, from Dan. Yeah, no, I would, I would, I would if, you, if you take it out of the kind of the Velo arena um, and look sort of more broadly, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, we, we've all said that to deliver sustainable developments, you do need a proper integrated team. Um, and, you know, you rely in many ways on the weakest link, you know, that, and, and Project managers and cost consultants, I think, are at the moment the weakest link, I would argue. And I think it's because there's a lot of architects and engineers, or the, well, if, if, if you have really good architects and, 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 and really good engineers and good cost consultants, they're not. But there are lots, I think, I think architecture is slightly more advanced and evolved around sustainable development. I think engineering is as well. And I think cost consultancy still has to sort of catch up at the kind of, at the, you know, the sort of the, av the average sort of, Levels. I think there is, and I think they have a huge amount of um, power. Actually, I think they have a huge amount of influence, just like the valuer as well. You know, the and and uh, the, uh, from a development point of view, sort of telling people, no, you must have air conditioning, etc. I think there are there are key people in a team who have huge amounts of influence, and I think project managers similarly, their kind of their openness or otherwise to risk when you're really rewarded by, uh, by program and budget. Uh, um, meet, meeting uh, time and, 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 and budget is, is really critical. So I think there is quite a lot of um, development that needs to happen in those two areas. Okay, thanks, Dan. Let's take some more questions. There's gentleman there in the blue sweater. As soon as the words Siberian and Pine were put together, the whole building sort of seems to leap up and down. 
Um, I'm a timber supplier. Um, we saw this as a whole opportunity to move forward. Why this sort of, uh, sort of logic of FSC only when PEFC is a perfectly creditable certification scheme and your timber panel saw that as being equal to uh, FSC. So it's very important to try and make sure as a legacy that we get this across <laughs> with timber being the only renewable building material that we have out there. Um, so I'd like to sort of see how that works on the legacy given that LOCOG seem to have taken everything that you've done, thrown it in the bin, and gone with FSC only. Okay, thank you. I know we could hold a whole event on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll try and do it for justice. Let's stay local. Gentleman there, please hand up. Uh, Ronan from Bioregional. Um, I've just a quick question. There was a lot of prefabricated concrete uh, mentioned, and I just wondered how you guys uh, managed to work with sort of low carbon mixes and getting cement replacement into the prefab because obviously you didn't have the support of the on site concrete supply. Okay, thank you. And another one locally, lady here. I'm going to try and urge the panel to try and keep the answers as, as informative but as crisp as possible so we can get through some more questions. Yes. Victoria from Aldersgate Group. I was just wondering if we knew how much more this project cost overall because it has such high sustainability values. Thank you very much. Okay, so the question about FSC versus PFC um, and broadening that out, the question about pre prefabricated concrete uh, and, and getting cement replacements and, and the overall cost premium. Who would like to have a first stab at that? Um, FSC versus PFC. Um, we had a policy of using both, as you know. Um, but on things like the uh, velo well, on, on issues like the velodrome's track, where we're looking for Siberian timber, we were much more comfortable with FSC. So for special, and the reason we're more interested in, we were, we were more, um, we, we wanted to use FSC over PFC is because we know, we, we did a lot of research and FSC put more people into the field, they have a wider range of skills that go out and look at how sustainable particular forests are and they do more of it. So FSC, however, a PFC, however, is, you know, is getting better all the time. It's uh, been adopted by far more um, suppliers. It's widely recognised. It's getting its its integrity is improving. I would say. I, you know, I think it came from quite a sort of low point. I think it's now become you know much. It's become a much better um, system. Um, and so we were. You know, we we got to the point where we were quite comfortable. One, we needed to get a huge amount of timber. We we didn't feel that FSC could provide all that timber. We didn't want uh, timber that was that there was only that wasn't FSC. So we wanted all of it to be certified. Getting the two bodies to work together, however, was extraordinarily difficult. FSC doesn't recognise PFC. Um, whereas PFC does recognise FSC, so there are there are issues when you're when you're dealing with that. So you know so why Locog are not adopting that is because I, I don't know. I mean I think they're just sort of they they're just less reasonable. I think our, our intention was to bring the whole industry up um, to a certain standard. I'm not quite sure what their objective is. Okay, um, I'm going to move this on to the um, to the concrete and the cement replacement question and the and the overall cost premium. Who would like to tackle the uh, the concrete question? I think in terms of, in terms of the precast, the, the specific, specification for the precast was exactly the sort of for the concrete mix was basically the same as the, the on-site mix. So we required a certain amount of cement replacement. We required a certain amount of uh, secondary aggregate. So in terms in that terms, it was uh, relatively straightforward. What the the interesting thing that did raise uh, did raise was that um, the secondary aggregate came from Cornwall. Uh, the precasting was done up in Cambridgeshire. So there is the, the irony that um, secondary aggregate was brought from Cambridgeshire, or sorry, brought from Cornwall up to Cambridgeshire and then the precast brought down to London. Uh, right next to the precast yard was a virgin aggregate um, quarry. So the question is, was that the right decision? But in many ways, that was working to, uh, that, that would probably be where you would say that setting certain requirements probably wasn't the right answer. So it, what, was it sustainable? I don't know. Was there a better way to do it? Maybe. And do we think overall there was a cost premium to requiring a sustainable venue? It's a million dollar question. I don't, I don't think we've ever done the, the really detailed analysis to, to properly answer that question. I know that we tried as far as possible, we definitely tried and achieved not, not to have what I, you'd almost term environmental bling so I mean we at one point we had a whole 
review of PVs on the roof in order to achieve a target. Yeah. And actually, it was coming out that, because we were looking at it as a park-wide, we could put a small amount of PVs on the, on the velodrome that achieved the right thing across the park in terms of a, um, a, a, the tick box approach, but actually was achieving very little for the building. And it suddenly became far, it sounds logical now, put, put roof lights on the building, don't put PVs, you get natural light in, you don't turn the lights on in the first place. Arguably, there was very little premium to be paid in terms of putting a, a roof light in as opposed to a, not. But um, <coughs> there would be some, but I think on, on, on our, it wasn't a, a, a large percentage. Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. It, yeah, it's, it's, it, there, there are so many different dimensions. You know, yeah. delivering certain elements of sustainability cost absolutely no more and actually save money. So, from a carbon, it's quite interesting. You know, we would have saved something like a couple of tons of um, of uh, uh, um, carbon a, a, a year from the PVs. Our overall, you know, we had a, a million tons of carbon from the embodied carbon. So, embodied carbon was far and away the most important issue by you know a factor of a hundred. And, and anything we could have done to reduce our in-use carbon was only going to affect, you know, the, 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 the performance very marginally, although it's over a sort of a decent... It was going to take 100 years to pay back, you know, the carbon based on the amount we're kind of using at the moment. So it's embodied carbon. When you're reducing embodied carbon, you're potentially kind of taking materials out and lightweighting a building and therefore saving money. You know, so from that point of view, there, there, are, there are potentially big sort of cost savings. It's something that Briam and other things don't pick up. Um, elements like renewables, we know they cost more. Building in a passive rather than an active uh, heating and cooling system, you know, is pretty much cost neutral and, and, and can save money. So again, it depends on which aspect of, of the sustainability debate you, you're looking at. Introducing the biodiversity agenda into the whole park uh, was really just changing one design specification for another. You know, 40, 45 hectares of biodiverse park out of a, whole, a total 100 uh, hectares of park is going to cost us no more. So, you know, a lot of the, the, the water uh, systems cost us a bit more, but not, you know, but, but pay back fairly quickly. So it really depends which aspect of sustainability you're looking at. I think there's an advantage that it was looked at as an overall programme. So it's an overall programme on the park. It's not an individual project. So that, that you certainly you get an overall cost saving by doing that. Whereas if you looked at certain things as individual projects, then there'd be more of a premium. So the energy centre is the best example, but that yeah. was all funded externally. Okay. I, 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 I just add something yeah. to that. I mean, I, I think it's fairly minimal. I mean, the only thing I can think of that was over and above uh, what you might have done otherwise was <coughs> the insulation in the walls, and uh, where we provide 300 mil of insulation. But that really came about because actually the structural depth was 300 mil, and we just filled the space up with insulation, uh, and we got that effectively that benefit that also helped us achieve the targets uh, because of our prefabricated units and the, the structural depth that we needed for that. Um, but uh, I mean, because we were under such cost pressures, there's no way that we could justify anything over and above what we actually needed to anyway. So. Thank you. Let's take a few more questions. Um, my, my disorder from, uh, from, from Crosswell. Mm -hmm. um, just picking up on the, uh, the, the question of cost, and there was a brief discussion um, uh, about two or three questions ago, focused very much, it seemed, on, on, on capital cost. I um, want to uh, really try and uh, get from the panel um, what their feelings are on uh, do they meet the... Uh, the challenge of delivering on, uh, on, on whole life cost. Um, I mean, clearly, in, I mean, you know, there's a, a big story, uh, I suspect, around energy, particularly in a, in a building like this. I know there was some work done on, uh, on, on design and lowering that energy usage, but in a highly technical event like this where you're, you're looking for this uh, track temperature of 28 degrees and so on, there's obviously a longer term impact of that, and I suspect there's a, a story linked into the overall uh, energy strategy for the whole Olympic Park. Uh, it would be interesting to understand that a little bit, I think. All right. Thank you. Could you pass it forward to the gentleman just in front of you? Uh, Patrick Cooper from Canada Woods, representing Western Red Cedar Export Association. I use Western Red Cedar for the cladding. Uh, it's got a 60-year um, lifespan plus without any coating. You chose to put a coating on. It's probably a good thing you did because you're going to manage the appearance much better. But I just wondered what coating you chose to use, uh, what implications it might have had in terms of the sustainability, cost, and future maintenance. Okay, thank you. Can you pass it just along two places? Thank you. Hello, Martin Pierce from Arnold Labour Timber World, uh, one of the timber supply panel, um, being heavily involved in the project throughout. Uh, 
We've seen some major lessons that have been learned, I guess, by the industry, certainly in the short term through this project, and um, Dan saying that sustainability doesn't happen on its own is definitely one of the things that's been driven through this project. Uh, I think, whereas the major contractors such as ISG have always driven sustainable procurement in timber, uh, it's been our experience that fur the further you get down the Man or the uh, client uh, base tier four or five contractors that there's been a lack of understanding. Um, do we think that these lessons can be maintained in the industry after the Olympics? Okay, thank you. All right, let's, let's, let's take those questions. So there's a question about, I think, how much consideration was given to whole life costing. We've, we've kind of touched on it, but perhaps there's a bit more to say there. About why rhubarb? Uh, in terms of the cedar coating uh, and, and more broadly, are, are we getting the message across in terms of uh, the timber certification, chain of custody, is that working its way through, do you think, hope as a, partly as a legacy of this sort of project? Okay. Um, whole, whole Life Cost was a, sort of, was a major driver very early in the project. You know, we, we developed a, um, a water strategy, an energy strategy, and in doing that we commissioned quite a lot of work to look at not just the carbon savings but also the <coughs> Um, the, the, the savings in, in raw materials or resources in, in, um, and also in, in cost. It's, um, you know, we ended up, in terms of uh, energy strategy, going down the line of a, you know, a combined cooling heat and power plant um, in which we have a contract that guarantees that all residents on the park will pay a, a little bit less than the standard price of gas, at, uh, you know, and it could be measured, I think, twice a year. Um, so that was important. The, we, the, the, we put a water system in, a, a black water treatment system in, which probably will use more carbon, actually, than if we had gone down a standard water uh, approach to water. And it possibly could cost more to deliver um, um, a black water from a, un, a treated black water from a, a membrane bioreactor than it would if we used the mains. And we've done that really to sort of look as a research project to look at the impacts on carbon, on perceptions, on quality, on uh, and on cost, and then and to determine whether these sorts of distributed systems um, kind of work. We looked at the, there are interesting things. You know, they use bare face concrete in this building. You know, they treated the the the, the, the timber, but they've used bare. That that ought to be very cheap to maintain. You know, you don't need to paint it. You don't need to. You know, it's very, it's high quality, but it's it should be a low, it should be low cost over the time. And certainly, the um, the, the Lee Valley uh, Park are very happy um, that it's a low, main, it's generally a low maintenance building. Things like the volume are really important. So the you know having less volume, you need to heat less. Given that you know the track will only be used by a few people, um, and having separated heating systems at different sort of levels means that you can heat small parts. The sort of the similarly with the lighting. So you know running the the buildings over time uh, should be cheaper as a result of many of the interventions that we've uh, we've looked at on this building. On other buildings, um, the aquatics, for example, that built with very very different objectives, they're very different um, from a very different perspective. A huge volume building would be probably quite expensive to maintain, and and there I don't think whole life costing was as much you know part of the the, the, the decision making process as as it was in you know in this building. Um, we could go into this for, for, for ages. Any, any other comments on, 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 the, on the timber issue? Do, do we think, does others on the panel generally think that the message is getting across in terms of chain of custody of the stewardship? Is, 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 the, is the industry getting, getting its head around this now? Uh, well, well, I can only speak as we find, um, to take your point. Uh, obviously, there's, there's lessons. If you, if you take a sustainability lesson that we've learned, it's, you know, it's the culture. What culture do you take away from, from building a sustainable building and working with a team like this? And the two, the two ingredients of culture is attitude and value. It's what attitude do you, do you want to put to what you're trying to do and what values do you put to it? And one of the things that we find, and I'm not bashing cost consultants, but w when we get there, um, you know, when, when we get to a, to a, you know, that they've been given a price to build this wonderful design building and when you go out there to actually try and procure the materials to build it, it's, you're looking at a cost battle. So then comes the good old term value engineering 
and then you start to look at where can you value engineer this building and there's only certain amounts of value engineering you can do and then it comes down purely to cost and unfortunately out there there are clients that are not um, as au fait with buying sustainable sources um, and you know it's a, ca it's a case of trying to educate that client but the client at the end of the day pays for the building and, and it's, it's trying to demonstrate um, from if you get sustainable, if you get it right, the end end result, the end use of the building, the values that you're going to get from the building, etc., are going to be. But you've got to get that initial outlay. The other thing that we've got is there, are, there is a lot of counterfeit, uh, which is coming in from from overseas, and it's counterfeit in metals, it's counterfeit in cables, uh, which is coming into the UK, and very good counterfeit. Um, I mean, we had an in inspection on all our cabling because there, there was such a volume of counterfeit cabling coming in which actually looked bona fide and, and right and it wasn't until you stripped it back and had a look at it that you could see that it was from counterfeit materials and it was all kite marked uh, and everything like that so there's, there's, a, there's a big lesson if you like to learn but for me we will always push that message out because that's, that's it if you're going to drive it you've got to try and drive it but it, it will always come down, unfortunately, it will come down to the client at the end of the day as to whether that client wants to uh, take the sustainability message on board. Okay, thank you. Uh, because of time, I'm going to take just two more questions, perhaps from this end of the room. And I'm, I'm going to chip in also a question of my own, which, which really I've brought with me from, from the launch event that we held in November, which a number of the panellists spoke about there, which is the question is, how much of the sustainability achievement for this particular project was delivered because of the commitments that were nailed down in the bid book. You know, the question is, was it done because it had to be done and that was an un unmovable, non-negotiable thing? Would it have happened any other way, I suppose, is, is that question. So if I can leave you to ponder that for a second, I'll take, I'm gonna sort of, uh, is anybody at this end? No, so gentlemen here. Good morning, Sam Cooper, E2 Architecture. Um, as a Briam AP, I was interested in uh, your comment that uh, Briam was a uh, box ticking exercise on this project. I was just uh, wondering uh, where you felt the shortfalls, obviously in brief, where you felt the shortfalls of Briam was on, on, on this project and where you, where you felt you had exceeded it without being rewarded. Okay, and then there was a gentleman just at the back there. <coughs> Uh, Ian Ball from Mont McDonald. You spoke about the importance of early contractor involvement, and Richard, you said right at the beginning how they came in as a, sort of, as, as a fantastic team right at the start. Yet, on that scene at the beginning, there was no contractor. Was there any particular reason why that wasn't the case, given the fact it's such an innovative design? And where, how could we bring contractors into the process earlier for these kind of structures in the future? Okay, thank you. And if I can just bolt on a supplementary comment to the Breen question. I mean, it's interesting. There's a debate going on in government right now about the possibility of them dropping their requirement for government buildings to achieve a brief, brief excellent standard. Um, uh, interesting in terms of whether or not government should show some leadership. We all know the, the effect that that can have in the market in terms of government sometimes being an anchor, an anchor tenant in a big building. It drives the industry to deliver a higher standard. So, so again, your thoughts on those questions is... You know, does sustainability have to be spelt out and nailed down in legally binding contracts for it to happen? Um, you know, setting those targets, does it drive innovation? Um, and, and then there's, there's a specific question about why not involve the contractor even earlier in this, in this particular instance. I'll, I'll take your question uh, on targets. I mean, we've produced a case study uh, and those slides that you saw, you've seen up there with the target set and actually what was achieved is a demonstration of, of so, so we can actually give that to, to if you like, prospective clients. So um, with, with the targets, it's interesting because the, the targets was, were, were set by the ODA, but we exceeded those targets. And I think the, the reason that we exceeded those targets is because um, there was a, I've talked about the culture, there was a culture that, that wanted to work together. And, and look at the values and, and, and see whether we could actually go one better. I think Dan said that, you know, that the targets they set they were going to be like 100% said, well, hold on a minute, that might be a little bit too far. Can we bring it back to 50? But I think when, we, when we, we sat at it, and I think through the design process, it would be, well, if we did this, we would actually be able to achieve that. And I think 
the corporate leave uh, of sitting down together will exceed targets in my in my book and and yes will we take them forward yeah too true we will and we can we, we want to demonstrate what can be achieved but I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my point it's it's going to depend on a client that wants to engage and spend the money because sometimes there is an additional cost and it's it's trying to get through to the client that that cost is well worth the effort initially uh, the code for staying behind Briam and other systems are absolutely essential. Um, but they're there for the lowest common denominator. And they, you know, they are a sort of standard tool. And on a project where you've got good designers, good program managers, good, you know, a, a great team, you just don't, you don't need them. You, know, you do need targets, but you don't necessarily need kind of standard tools like that. You need targets that are bespoke and specific to very complex projects. Um, if you took them away, however, the, the, there, there will be a real tendency for many in the industry, I think, to start you know, reducing their standards. I think you know, it's what Vint is sort of effectively saying, and I think, I think that's true. I think we have to have a, you know, a day minimus, and then we should, but then we should be encouraging people to go well beyond that. And I think you know, we should just recognise that all standards are, are limited, and therefore if you say we've got a Briam excellent building, it doesn't mean you've got a, an amazing building, it means you've met a particular sort of standard. So you know, I ju I just, you've just got to be very careful with that. You know, we, yes, in terms of your question, commitments, um, we are British and therefore we had commitments and we will meet them. You know, uh, other countries have commitments and don't necessarily have the same attitude towards them. I think it's a very, very British thing there. Uh, you know, but, but, it's, but actually it was much more in our culture. You know, the fact we made the commitment, the fact we knew which commitments we wanted to make. There'd been a lot of rigour and a lot of thinking years before about this site. It wasn't an accident that we made certain commitments. Other other countries tend to make all sorts of fanciful commitments. I think ours were really quite realistic. They were very, and they were really <laughs> sustainability commitments. And so they just, they, they happen to align with a, a, a broader sort of mindset in government and in the wider community. People like yourselves have been kind of working on this agenda for a long time before. And so we, it, was, it was quite sort of natural to adopt the commitments we made. Okay. I'm going to have to, I'm afraid, wrap it up there. I know we haven't fully answered all of your questions, and I know there were other questions. Uh, but unfortunately, we've got our next uh, event in this room in about 15 minutes. So we need to wrap it up there. Just a few things, though, uh, before we finally finish. Um, that is, I'd like to highlight the next series. As I say, there's a masterclass that's already fully booked, I'm afraid, uh, in sh following shortly. But then looking ahead, our next event in this format is looking at the Aquatic Centre uh, on Tuesday the 28th of February. It's booking up very fast, but you can still book a few places today. And that's followed uh, on the same day by the Energy and Carbon Masterclass. The masterclasses in particular are filling up very fast. So please do uh, book those places if you haven't already. Uh, the other thing is I've got a few thank yous. I want to once again thank um, Atkins for, for being our partners on this, on this series. Uh, in addition to my colleagues who are working so hard, working with literally dozens of people from across the Olympic project to put these events together. I'd also like to point out um, Hattie Hartman, who is the um, sustainability edi editor of AJ, who has just launched her new book um, around the sustainability of the design of the London Olympics. And she's here with copies of her book outside. So do go and say hello to um, Hattie and shameless plug, buy a copy of her book as well. Um, finally, I think I would like to thank all of our panelists uh, Richard Arnold, Chris Bannister, Andrew Weir, Vincent Busk and Dan Epstein for an excellent presentation this morning and congratulations on a fantastic project delivered. Thank you very much. <laughs>